Thank you, Marty. Um, thank you, Dr. Villardo, for your inspiring work. Bye. Bye-bye. No. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so Cambium was a, a team effort. Um, as at, at the end of its tenure, we had a, we had a good run. And uh, I'm Samuel Hawker, the co-PI in the end of the at the end of it, and I am in the one NASA. So in this talk, I actually have three, um, three points I'd like to uh, get across to those that will be listening. Uh, one is, you know, motors are relevant to electric propulsion flight. You're gonna need the motors to fly the planes. Uh, it seems obvious. Um, and so their relevance, they, you know, they deserve attention uh, for getting the best flight we can achieve. Um, two, additive manufacturing does enable um, additional design landscape to uh, push motor tech to the edge of what it can do. And three, uh, legacy manufacturing uh, and assembly techniques are truly inescapable. So um, uh, the best way I think to think about additive manufacturing is an additional tool in the toolbox uh, for a given designer. All right. Um, the big questions that led us to the Camium work, um, for, these are the big NASA questions at the top, enable cleaner, uh, fuel efficient, hybrid electric propulsion, dramatically increase power density of motors, um, and the ultra efficient commercial vehicles transition to low carbon propulsion. Uh, the Camium big question was, can emerging manufacturing technologies, additive manufacturing, uh, enable novel electric motor concepts for achieving high power densities uh, required for propulsion of um, aircraft, uh, such as urban air mobility. Um, so we kind of sense that urban air mobility is on the horizon and it's basically going to happen. The momentum is there. The desire is there. People have helicopters in their own front yard if you're rich enough, but we bring down the cost and we start entering that three-dimensional travel space. Um, so that's a motivation, that's a driver for getting uh, to the best possible motors we can. And then we looked at the NASA 15 passenger tilt wing uh, to assess, you know, what is our approach going to be for the maximal benefit. Um, that being said, let me describe a little further in uh, using this slide. So we did a system study, systems analysis on that uh, 15 passenger tilt wing. And what I'd like to point out, this thing, if it does work, uh, if you look at the x-axis here, it, we're at like 80%, 30% to 80%. Uh, and the x-axis here on varying the efficiency of the motors, we're down around 7%. Uh, potential improvement in the flight characteristics for this aircraft. So the point is tens of a percentage of increases from changing from the baseline by improving power density versus ones of percentage increase in uh, pushing the efficiency to 100%. So we really focused on improving the power density for the most bang for the buck. Uh, now this is the uh, state-of-the-art motor we use to kind of base our investigations and, and measure against. Um, it was produced by our uh, uh, small business industry partner, LaunchPoint, out of Santa Barbara here. Real quickly, um, this particular motor was about four pounds, seven and a half inches uh, in diameter. It ran at 8.3 kilowatts, um, 7,500 RPMs, 94% efficiency, and four kilowatt per kilogram uh, power density. So. I'm going to talk a lot about parts uh, in the next couple of slides, so I'm going to take a second and tell you kind of what these different parts are. Um, what you see here on the back is a rotor plate, and you see the magnets all sucked into the pockets of the rotor plate. This orange, th this orange looking material is the stator that goes through the middle of the between two rotor plates. So the opposite rotor plate is sitting on the other side along with the uh, housing component, the housing component is connected to the uh, bearing and the bearing is connected to the shaft that transfers the load to the propeller. So um, these are x-ray CT scans looking at uh, the windings of the stator and you can clearly see the uh, magnet triplets. This particular motor is uh, so efficient because it uses a, lot, uses a haulback array to focus all the energy into the stator on both sides. 
Uh, on the right here, this is a testing uh, with a dynamometer, and then this is a propeller test. So I'll talk about a propeller test that we did uh, going into the talk. Yeah, this is a really good state, a really good motor for what its class is. And this is where its class sits on the uh, overall kind of landscape of motors. So here's a Yasa 400. The state of the art I just mentioned is right here at about, uh, I think that's like seven kilowatt continuous power is where it's plotted here. X axis is continu continuous power. So that's the size of your motor and your Y axis are your power density. So the state of the art to reiterate is here. And then our cameum goal was to see if we could use additive manufacturing designs to, uh, for this motor size, uh, increase its power density at that level. So here's what we did. Um, on the, let, let's first talk about the equation. This slide has some stuff going on, but the equation, uh, delta P specific is your specific power. Uh, we use this equation to kind of test and measure against um, what our, what our um, components would bring to the motor's overall specific power improvement. Uh, Km is a most motor constant that is uh, the interaction between the magnet fields and the stator. Um, T is basically it's temperature, so how hot can it get? Delta R is resistance, which is actually governed by uh, the, your ability to reject heat in the process. So the more you can reject the heat, the lower you can get delta R, so you, you want to improve that. Um, w shaft is, I think, your, your torque on your shaft, and delta mass is the total mass of your um, of your motor. So looking at the stator, which um, was in the wheelhouse of Glenn and uh, UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso, a university partner, um, and LaunchPoint actually. So three of our, three of our partners we were working on this. Um, we identified that we could increase the temperature of the stator by using a different material to up to 220C and we could improve the um, Km, or motor constant, um, by using an iron, um, iron wedge-filled concept stator. Uh, we can see the different components of that uh, in an exploded view uh, here. And uh, this image here might be hard to understand what's going on, but in short, there are slots that are cut into a piece of plastic and then iron wedges are slipped into those slots, and then traces are printed on, um, on these two other pieces that go on either side. And those traces actually carry the current in place of wire. Now, the di where additive manufacturing comes in, you're like, oh, well, that was CNC, and you made your, well, additive manufacturing comes in, is it costs about 20 grand to make that with the legacy method, whereas we could print it for $1,000 and then we're bringing the cost down to something where uh, uh, we get to the more affordability of, of air transport. So additive manufacturing has the ability to help with the cost on the stator. The stator uh, improvements that we were found could imp improve by 68% over the baseline that we were looking against for the motor. And then uh, at Langley, we actually were looking at the structural and heat, uh, heat rejection uh, components. Um, our, our approach here was save mass and reject heat. Um, we followed the same equation for evaluation. We were able to achieve a 20% increase by saving a significant mass on the housing compared with the baseline, which is arguably not additive enabled. Um, Topological optimization will inform the design and you could probably make that out of a different process. But the one thing that I think kicks it over the top is um, we have about a 25% improvement on heat rejection with the, um, with the heat sink cooling ring. And that particular part could not have been really made any other way. So uh, that uh, uh, the 20% here, um, 4% is in weight, and the rest, or 16% approximately, is through this cooling rejection, or the improved cooling or the heat rejection that the, the heat sink ring enables. So in that case, I think additive is, is a truly enabling of that particular part. Putting it all together, we're looking at a 100% increase, so 2x improvement in um, power, specific power. Uh, uh, 
we determine that that is uh, what we think is feasible based on our, our work. In this plot, we actually see the, the test of the baseline component on, on the propeller test stand. So this is an image of the propeller test stand. And the black line is the state-of-the-art uh, motor that was tested. Red line is what we determined to be feasible. Now, uh, x-axis is speed, RPM, and y-axis is power density. Um, so if you look at 7,500 RPM, as I mentioned earlier, the specs of the baseline motor, 7,500 RPM is right about four um, kilowatts per kilogram. And we see that four is right here on our state-of-the-art plot. So then cambium feasible uh, is about eight. So we're right at the bottom of what our cambium goals were uh, for what we can achieve if we have the full thing put together. Um, we did, as part of, I guess, CAS's goals were improving uh, capability. Uh, we did improve capability along the way on this project um, at, at both Glenn and uh, Langley and Armstrong. So uh, that was also a, a big benefit. So our teaming partner, uh, this didn't happen in a vacuum. We had multiple folks uh, working together, uh, NASA Glenn, NASA Langley, um, Armstrong Flight Research Center, Launch Point out of Santa Barbara uh, was giving a lot of feedback on stator concepts. University of Texas El Paso was trying to streamline um, how to make a Litzwire stator using a uh, ultrasonic embedding technique. So there's a what I've presented here is very short and to the point, but we have a lot of stuff we've done uh, to, to bring us to what I've given you today. Um, Electric motors move aircraft through the air. They are going to be a relevant component as we make um, urban air mobility a reality. Um, they are going to be a relevant cost component because they are going to be one of the more expensive things on the aircraft. Well, maybe. I don't know. Composites can get up there. <laughs> so uh, anyways, um, uh, we recommend, based on our work, not to try to do it for absolutely everything. Try and do it smart. Use it as a tool in the toolbox. Um, I think that uh, heat rejection parts are primed and should be um, uh, investigated for uh, utilizing additive whenever possible. And the AM design space, maybe it can open up uh, new thoughts on a motor designer who's just trained only in motor design and maybe they can have a thought that we didn't see in, in our work. Um, legacy manufacturing techniques are inescapable. Um, every additive part that is made is post-processed, either heat treatment, which is based on uh, microstructural and uh, uh, residual stress knowledge, it's legacy known knowledge, or, um, or you know, hitting it with a chisel and hammer, or polishing, or cutting, or honing, or tapping. Anyways, uh, everything you do in a machine shop is going to be applied to uh, most of your additive components. Um, so think of it as a complement. And uh, the Camium team, this is, uh, I guess, cast and crew. I'll leave it here for credits, and uh, that's it. We're a minute and 40 fast, so try and catch up. So I have your notes here. Maybe I can cheat and ask you questions. Yeah, you know, I, didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even use them. <laughs> Already. Anybody? Sure. Excited about? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So. Is this on? Yes. Okay. So um, obviously the calculations you did were based on the current state of the art. Um, is there a certain size motor that say? you implemented it in Cobox that maybe you would see other optimizations. Um, so like what's the trade-off between the current form factor you're working on versus maybe scaling up or down? Do you see any improvements there? Um, so you're just asking about motor size. Could we access different parts of that chart where we had the green bubble? 
or versus the x-axis like say go above yasa rather than the seven and a half inch right yeah so is, is there a certain size where you see it being fully optimized i guess is oh is there a <laughs> based on the parameters that you're changing um you know honestly there's a, a lot of trade space in motors um and uh and there, there, I think there are a lot of tricks you can do to tell a, a story. Um, so I, I'm sure there'll be someone somewhere that will say yes. Uh, my general feeling is is that based on the, the, the technologies that really like drove that 2X, uh, namely utilizing haulback array, uh, uh, the iron in the stator, and heat rejection, heat sink ring, uh, those technologies I think are uh, well, first, let's start with the haulback array and size of a motor. So the bigger you make your diameter, the greater you make your power. And so as you make it bigger and bigger, you increase the forces of your magnets trying to whip out. And you also create greater and greater challenges for balancing your rotor plates, et cetera. A lot of that stuff, honestly, is again, it's dealing with kind of editing the design. So maybe your walls aren't so thick on the edges. You thicken them up. Um, uh, so to hold your magnets and maybe you just get somebody who's really better at balancing but uh, implementation I think it's doable um, your scale and your size with additive is uh, the, the same as any other manufacturing technique the bigger you make a thing the higher risk you are that your parts gonna be perfect as you expect it to be so I, I don't see um, I think yes, you can apply this. To the, the things we found, you can apply to larger scale motors, uh, with the caveat that the same levels of caution that you have with scaling anything up on any manufacturing process would would be there. Mm -hmm. And I think assembly is probably one of the things I, I haven't really talked about in this short talk. But assembling a larger motor is more difficult not only because you've got to keep it perfectly flat in a larger diameter, but when you're bringing them close together and those magnetic forces start trying to grab each other, you've got to be really careful that you're not, you know, uh, tilting or breaking the stator that you put all that work into. So uh, maybe those things can get overcome if you have like a, a assembly line factory style and you've got the, exactly the right tooling uh, to get the job done right every time, but that's a level of investment that would have to be considered. So maybe sort of related to that, actually, my question was, can you scale down again? Yeah. And it uh, sounds like actually scaling down is easier. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say scaling down, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. but how small do you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want to go down to nanoscale, then we want to talk about additively with a fib <laughs> instead, of, uh, instead of a laser-based yeah. system. But yeah, you yeah. Could, I think you could scale down to reasonable sizes. Yeah, there are some 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 companies in the ecosystem that maybe you should talk to. Um, guys trying to do similar things with motors, but I think you'll be quite complimentary. So let me see if I can introduce you to some of those. Sure. Yeah. We'd be happy to yeah. help or transition it, yeah. the, the technology. When you think about the major failure modes of an electric motor and uh, the need for reliability you know, in the safety context, um, how do you see the areas of, of application of additive manufacturing that you've explored as contributing to that, to helping build more reliable motors? Um, the only way I see it uh, helping build more reliable motors is with uh, thermal management components. So if you're, and I appreciate that you're tossing this low, low easy pass, I guess, but um, for example, the heat sink ring taking out more heat, as an example of an additively enabled component, um, enables a motor to operate at a lower temperature uh, for a given operation scheme. So you're running at 6,000 RPMs all the time. Without the heat rejection, you're running at, I don't know, 150 C. With the heat rejection, maybe you're running down 140 C. Well, that 10 C uh, adds up over time with regards to the thermal breakdown of materials. So. I, I would argue that it would help, things like that would help with uh, reliability. However, looking at utilizing structural components like the uh, aluminum housing, I would, I would caution against that at this point because 
the jury's still out with regards to um, confidence in additive parts for structural uh, longevity. And even the rotor plates, I know titanium's hard to machine and all, but, uh, and it's easy to make them out of additive, but I, I would still caution that, you know, you'd have to get your confidence intervals to the same levels that they are now with machine titanium before uh, switching them out for reliability purposes. So there's further work that needs to be done there for structural stuff. But thermal stuff, I think the fruit's ripe and go ahead and keep moving. Okay, and on, on the, um, uh, you had a graph that plotted RPM versus mm -hmm. uh, specific power. Mm -hmm. And what is the RPM range that you're hearing from launch point or that you were assuming would be the operational model for the motors that you were designing? You know, wh where's, where's the consensus thinking on that? Because of course there's direct drive versus a gearbox and a bunch I, of trade-offs. Yeah, the, yeah the, you, you're, you're talking about a space that is, is hard for me to, uh, to enter into. I mean, Kurt, you probably have more experience I mean, dealing with clear, propellers clearly and there's stuff. there's a lot of power so. density to be had at those higher RPMs, yeah. but there's, you know, pitfalls there. Yeah, so uh, and that's what I'm saying. It depends on your propeller and your application. And so all that, whatever your application is, is going to drive your motor uh, selection and design. So it depends on what propeller, what plane, if it's a, a power lift propeller or efficiency, long range propeller. Uh, so there's just a lot of trade space there, especially it's, it's application dr driven. Absolutely. Um, my, I don't know what the question is other than that. I well, mean, yeah, does 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 the the technology that you developed um, change that trade off? Does it does it work only at lower RPM, or is it really indifferent? And that's just specific to the individual way that you apply it in a given design. Well, for example, let's 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 go into the uh, the stator and the motor constant. So we and the, if we use the iron uh, wedge stator and we use the iron full stator, I guess you increase your torque, so you're going to increase your power density, but you're going to take a hit on efficiency. And so the Litz wire is really like the most efficient uh, uh, stator choice you can make. And um, and so if your application is takeoff, then probably you know, your power density is going to be what matters, but then if your application is long range tip motors or whatever, you're going to want to use the, the, the Litz wire stator. So, um, I, yeah, I don't know if I can answer your question like you need it, but uh, that's what I got. That's good for me. The one question here, how do additively manufactured parts tolerate vibration? I would say no, so this is again is, is uh, alluding to confidence levels in fatigue yeah. and strength. And, um, and it's gonna be based on, um, I mean there are a couple ways you could, you begin to try to answer this or, or, or or address this this kind of a question and one of them is uh, little tiny deviations in in stress over time and cycles or really big deviations in stress uh, over cycles and when I say big I mean well it's relative intent uh, um, magnitude um, and one might fail sooner or later than another um, and my argument for additive versus traditionally uh, made stuff is that most of the additive stuff, even if you polish it, takes a hit um, of anywhere from 10 to 20% on fatigue life. Um, uh, so you have a, a, you know, almost one to one. And the question is, okay, fine, but do we have a full handle right now on um, its microstructure behavior and uh, post-processing of the the heat treatments to fix that and then the uh, porosity effects on that um, and then once we can find a acceptance level where we're like okay uh, additively manufactured parts are going to perform this way all the time maybe it's 10 maybe it's 20 percent lower than uh, legacy manufacturing material can you accept that in your application is really the question 
do the trades or the benefit of the part that you're enabling, uh, or, or is it short-term enough of a trial of a design? Does that, is that okay with you for your application rather than can additive replace my legacy? It's not gonna replace legacy, it is a complement to legacy. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of thinking out loud here, but adding to some of the complementary aspects of additive manufacturing, is there any incentive to um, add like structural health monitoring and those type of things that we're now seeing out of additive manufacturing to this? Do you see that being advantageous as well? Uh, structural like health in, monitoring, you like mean? Like integrated added? sensors and those type of things that we're now Oh, in integrating like 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 threading or, exactly. or integrating sensors into a part that's been that while it's being made, again it's going to be dependent on uh, your designer's criteria. <coughs> I mean, if you can find a, a range that says, okay, this is only going to be this much stress that we anticipate, or else it'll break, and it's within your criteria, absolutely. I mean, go ahead. That's but if it's not and it's for flight and it's not certified, don't put it on your plane right now. <laughs> So, given where you're at, in in your mind, what's next? What's what's your next? Uh, oh, uh, wh right now I'm transitioning my work to um, to in situ monitoring of additive parts to identify defects as they're happening in real time, and then as those defects are, are identified, then we can then uh, ide like uh, trace that to testability of okay, we are producing defects with this particular. I'm going to call it uh, uh, additive setup. So you, you essentially set up a recipe, mm -hmm. and that recipe produces a defect. And if we sense it that it's you know, happening at that same spot uh, regularly, then we can start testing that versus, all right, what's the, uh, if, we have, if we know we have a defect in a part that looks like this, what's its impact on the part? That's, I think, really the next step, especially as you start saying, all right, we want to make bigger parts that take weeks to print. Uh, you want your confidence to be high on those. So that's, that's where, yeah. and this motor stuff is, if you're talking about structural, that's why I keep saying thermal. Somebody's working thermal and they want to design thermal stuff, I think additives ripe for it and we can go ahead and we should have that in the design toolbox. But structural stuff, um, we really need to develop our confidence levels or else this motor, it's never gonna see the light of day until we get confidence in the, in the structural stuff. Yeah, well, I think that there's a good question here. Can you scale up to replace engines on the aircraft in general aviation fleet? They should say which year, but yeah. Oh, you're talking about like the plane I flew over here on? <laughs> no, general <laughs> aviation. Which one did you fly around? Uh, it's a 737, I guess. Uh, that's not general aviation, but the smaller one. Um, Cessna. <laughs> Uh, what, what is that, like a 20-inch motor? I'm not sure. How big are those motors? Does anybody know the size of that kind of well, motor? In terms of horsepower in a Cessna, we're talking 200, 300 horsepower. A couple hundred horsepower. Yeah. Maybe 25 inches. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't I mean, know. Essentially, you'd be replacing the Joby motor. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I've seen that motor, and I'm not saying that we can handle that. Yeah, no. And you didn't stay at the Holiday Inn Express yesterday either. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> But I'll take a Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much. Thanks. Mm.